Good morning and welcome to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. You're listening to Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Because that's the goal, to bring you faith-enriching programs over the air, streaming online, or through your favorite podcasting app, or even the KFUO app. However you tune in, thank you for your support. If you have questions or comments about today's show, I invite you to reach out to me via email at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, even if you just want to say hello. If you do write in, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing how you're tuning in and where you're listening from. Now, we're grateful here at KFUO for the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, which sponsors Thy Strong Word. You can support us by supporting the great work that they do for the kingdom. Visit lhfmissions.org. Now, a blessed Wednesday, August 17th to all of you. Today, we have made it to Romans chapter 4. In the previous chapter, we heard that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, and now he's going to use none other than the patriarch of the Jews to give us an example of just what he means. To help us explore the scriptures this morning is a very special guest to me, the Reverend John Green, who is an ordained teacher at Grace Chapel Lutheran School and also, I think, an all-around uh, uh, utilitarian pastor, someone they're always putting to work because we always need the service of pastors at the, uh, at the chapel there. Uh, pastor Green, welcome to the show. Thank you, Pastor Boo. It's a pleasure to be here today. Now, you and I know each other because, and our listeners wouldn't know this, but I did not grow up Lutheran. I know, it's a shock. I grew up in the western part of North Carolina, and there uh, there aren't, there just aren't a lot of Lutherans. And so the very first Lutheran church that I ever visited was uh, the church that John Green here was the pastor of, and that's how he and I met. And so it's just really exciting because, you know, now um, lots of things have happened, I think even since the last time that we talked, but you are now in St. Louis, no longer in Western North Carolina. You've been in St. Louis for quite a while doing all types of ministry. Tell me a little bit about what you've been doing since I last saw you face to face. Well, I've been in St. Louis for a number of years now. Uh, I am presently teaching at Grace Chapel Lutheran Church and School in Bell Fountain Neighbors, which is a suburb of St. Louis in what they call the North County area. Uh, I've been there for a number of years teaching middle school math and science. Uh, I've been athletic director. I coached basketball. Uh, I've worn a number of different hats, including some pulpit supply, both in my own church and the other churches in the area as, as there's, there has been need. Well, you know, what I think is uh, very interesting about your story is that your first call was to Our Savior Lutheran Church in Clyde, North Carolina, which was my very first Lutheran church. Right. And uh, you're the one who who encouraged me to go into the ministry, which I think is amazing. And then as I was going into the ministry, uh, you said, you know what, I think I'm going to go and become a math teacher. <laughs> now... Obviously, you never left the ministry because you've been probably just as busy as any pastor I know since then uh, doing <laughs> ministry work in addition to all the great teaching and stuff. But um, tell me a little bit about you know why you sort of made that transition from full-time pastor to full-time teacher and also you know doing pastorate work you know as needed. Sure. Well, um, I had had thoughts of of going into teaching for quite a while, going back to my vicarage where I was very much involved in, in the school, at the church where I was. Um, and I had been in Our Savior for 12 years, and I might add 12 wonderful years. Those were tremendous people, uh, as, as you well know, and it was a great church. But I had gotten to a point where I knew that either I was going to have to move on in some sense or 
uh, I was going to be there for 30 years or something like that. Um, and through what would be a very long story, I will condense that through much prayer and consideration, um, I knew that God was moving me not only to a different location, but into a different situation, uh, that being teaching. So I went back, I uh, got a Master's of Arts of Teaching degree from Western Carolina University and actually started teaching in the public schools of Haywood County, North Carolina, and was there for uh, seven years. Truly, tremendously enjoyed that time. During that time, I was still, again, doing some pulpit supply and, uh, and other pastoral sorts of things, uh, but then uh, ended up with a call to, uh, to Grace Chapel to teach and to be able to preach some still. And uh, that, at that time, definitely seemed like uh, the right fit. And so I have been up here now for about, uh, about nine years. Well, I think that sounds great. It's amazing how God will use us, you know, however he sees fit. And, you know, you, you shout out to Western Carolina University, which is also my alma mater for my bachelor's degree, right. which is in criminal justice. And yeah. so that just goes to show you, and I don't use that as much as you would think in the pastoral right. ministry, but you know what? I use it probably more than you'd think too. But regardless, um, I'm very happy to have been influenced early on in my ministry career by this great man who is our guest today. Um, Pastor Green, we're going to go ahead and get digging in, but before we begin our study, would you graciously offer up a short prayer? I certainly will. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you on this day for friendships and relationships that span through your church. Lord, we also on this day especially thank you for your word and that through your word you bring us the good news of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we dig into your word today, we pray that you will teach us, that you will give all of us who are, who are here listening and participating, that you will give us a measure of your spirit that you will guide us and that you will uplift our hearts in the good news that Jesus is indeed our risen Savior. We come to you, Lord, and we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 4 begins with the phrase, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham? Well, what then suggests, as Paul's letter has been showing us so far, that Paul's arguments simply cannot be easily separated into chapters and verses. You have to always look at the context. So in just a few sentences, kind of catch us up before we dig right into chapter four. Um, he says, what then? What has he been saying before? Well, one of the things I find interesting about this section of Romans is, is as we look at the beginning of chapter three, Paul starts off by saying, what advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? And he answers his own question by saying much in every way. And I can just imagine some of his original readers, some of the, the Jewish uh, readers in particular, uh, who would have read that and thought, oh, well, Paul must be on our side, so to speak. Um, and then Paul continues on and through a, a number of verses, he talks about the fact that, that no one is righteous. And he comes to this point in verse 23 where he says, There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so he has hooked these people in and then shown them that perhaps some of their own ideas weren't so correct and that it's not about our works or even about our pedigree, but it's about the work of Christ on our behalf, the work of God who sent the Savior. And here he also then brings in the idea that it's not just for the Jews either. It is for them, but it's also for the Gentiles. So I can imagine some of the reactions that people must have had when they first read that chapter and kind of went, now, wait a minute, what's <laughs> going on here? And oh, he's really going to take that and go farther with it as we go into chapter four. I, yeah, absolutely right. I can absolutely imagine that too, you know. Well, you know, you just said that there are there are all these great advantages, even though, of course, he only lists one. He only lists right. that they have the oracles of God. It sounds like he's going to have this big, long list, but then he just right. gives sort of the more important one. 
But yeah, I mean, I think we we see that even in our own ministries, um, growing up in uh, different sort of churches down south, you know, there w- often the service would begin with, you know, the good old hymn, we're going to heaven and you can't go. <laughs> and that, that's because a lot of people <laughs> believe that that even faithful Christians are sometimes misled to believe that they're saved because they're a good Baptist, a good Methodist, or a good Lutheran. And so if you were to say, what then is the advantage to being a Lutheran, then there is much in every way. You've been given good doctrine, but then it would be also like going on to remind them, though, that we're not saved by our perfect doctrine because all are sinners and need the salvation that comes from Christ alone. So I think we we can definitely identify with that. I I agree, Pastor Boone. It's always interesting how it always seems to come back around to, to, to the law. And, and the reality, not the law as something we are able to attain, but, but the law as something that reminds us that we are sinners. We look in that mirror of the law and we see that. And then we are then, we can go to no other place than the gospel, which shows us again the grace of God in our salvation and in our forgiveness. Absolutely. So, yeah, he kind of ends that section three with, you know, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. And that brings us to chapter four. And we're going to read the first uh, eight verses here before we discuss them. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Here we go. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Boy, those are just amazing gospel words from St. Paul. And uh, yeah, let's dig in. Uh, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham? What is he talking about here? Well, a- Abraham, of course, uh, was someone who was looked up to by those who would follow him, uh, those who felt they had had lineage from him, and that that to them counted as something and perhaps counted uh, to God also. But then Paul says this very interesting thing in, in verse 2, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, He had something to boast about, but not before God. So I find it interesting here that that Paul says, you know, if Abraham was justified by works, uh, that there would be something he could boast about. He could boast about that to his fellow human beings. He could say to them, well, look, I am better than you. Here's all the list of things that I have done uh, that perhaps you haven't done, but, uh, but look where I am. And yet, even if that were true, and we know it's not, but even if that were true, he still could not boast before God. Hmm. That, here, that here, Paul throws in just a little reminder of God's absolute ultimate holiness. But then, of course, he, he clarifies the whole thing in the reality when he says, if Abraham was justified by works, but we know he wasn't justified by works. And verse 3 continues that beautifully. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Oh, I, you know, I love that. You know, when we preach, someone once asked me, they said, you know, how do you figure out what to preach about? And there's lots of ways, brother, right? We, we think mm-hmm. about maybe what's going on in the world and how Christ addresses that. Sometimes we think about what's going on in our congregation You know, how can we encourage them in the good things that they're doing? How can we, you know, as pastors and overseers, you know, admonish them in loving ways to turn away from their sins? But you know what? Sometimes, and this is just true for me and maybe it's not for you, but sometimes I say, 
I just think of my own sin and I preach against it because I figure if I've fallen into that sin, someone else has too. And the reason I bring that up is because I wonder if when Paul is talking about if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, he's thinking about himself. How often has Paul described himself, you know, as the Jew of Jews? I think he, you know, as the one who keeps the law perfectly before Christ, he probably thought those things were true. But then when coming to Christ, he realizes that, yeah, he might have something to boast about by being kind of better at doing certain things than other people, but none of that counts before God, just as you said. And of course, Abraham, the great patriarch, you know, even his good works certainly, certainly did not uh, credit to him righteousness, but rather the faith that he was given. Um, and, and you know, it, Paul being, if someone were to look at him externally, especially after he had been in the faith a number of years, uh, had been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write so much, had planted churches, had done missionary journeys, it would have been very easy for someone, perhaps such as you or I or any of our listeners, to look at somebody like that and go, wow, there's a super Christian. There's somebody that I don't think I measure up to. And yet, what was it that Paul said about himself? Chief of sinners, he called himself at one point, uh, because Paul knew what we don't know about Paul. That's right. That uh, in his internal life, in his internal self, he was able to see through, again, the mirror of the law, his own sin, which was very real and very great. And that also would have been true for Abraham as well. I'm sure there were those in Abraham's day who looked at him and looked up to him, and to a degree for good reason. But at the same time, Abraham himself knew his sin and knew that he wasn't working his way out of it. There had to be something else. And for him and for Paul and for you and me and all of our listeners, that something else is the work of God on our behalf in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Oh, I think that's so wonderful to point out because, you know, I, when you talked about if we were to look at Paul externally, you know, we would say, here's this super Christian. And mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think in the back of my head, yeah, you know what we'd probably do? We'd probably name a bunch of churches after him. And uh, of course, you're at Grace Chapel, you're off the hook, but I'm over here at St. John, which is a, a similar situation. So for those of you who are listening and going to St. Paul Lutheran Church, then you get to tell people, we named this church in honor of St. Paul, not because he was perfect, but because like us, he is the chief of sinners. Right. Now, I don't know how many St. Abraham Lutheran churches well, that, there are. That's um, an interesting thought. I don't know either. I, I don't know that I've ever heard of one, actually. No, but I want to plant one just right now just because of that. Well, it, as we get into verse four, then he does, he expands on that. He talks about works being wages, not counted as a gift. Um, let's keep going. Go on into that. Uh, you know, any to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, faith is counted as righteousness. And then he appeals I mean, he's already appealed to Abraham, but he brings out the other big guns and appeals to what David says. And we know David is a chief of sinners, just like St. Paul, and yet a man after God's own heart. How can we reconcile this to this idea of works and faith? Right. Um, well, again, even when we pull out the, the proverbial big guns, the faith, so to speak, um, we recognize that it, it goes back to what he said in chapter 3. It's kind of, kind of an anchor verse there in chapter 3, verse 23, where he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he doesn't just mean all of a certain group or all of a group of people who haven't quite got it right. He means all. And that would include an Abraham. It would include a Paul, a David. Uh, a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, that would include him too, uh, as it would include all of our listeners today. Um, so we recognize that, that, that we are all in that same proverbial boat, even with the greats of the faith. And yet it was for us and for them that, once again, we are freely justified by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, which once again was meant for all. That's the message that we have for the world. 
I've mentioned on this program before already that unbelievers look at us and the world looks at us. And when I say us, I mean those in the church. And they think, you know what? Here are hypocrites who think that they're better than other people. And yet the quotation here from David is that blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. The yes. church probably could do a better job of proclaiming the reality that we are gathered by God in worship, not because we are perfect, not because we are super Christians, uh, that, but because rather we uh, are people who have on our record lawless deeds. We have not kept the law perfectly. We have sins, but yet we are blessed. And that blessing comes, and these are all pa- this is passive language. The blessing comes from outside of us. Blessed yeah. are those whose deeds are forgiven. By whom? By God, whose sins are covered. By what? The blood of Christ. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. You know, and if I was a Jew in the first century and I was raised to understand that righteousness comes from works of the law, I think I would be keeping a very close record of all the good works that I did and all the laws that I kept. And I would be very concerned about getting before the Lord. Uh, and if I was wanting to spend eternity with him, I would be very concerned that all of my good works outweighed all of my not so good works. And yet here is this controversial statement that the Lord's not going to is not going to count your sin against you. Even if you have lawless deeds, they are forgiven and removed. I think that's an amazing message to the Jews who are in Rome, to the Roman Christians who are not Jews, because this is the argument that Paul is making. If you Jews are looking at these Gentiles and you're thinking, well, we're better than them, or you Gentiles even are looking at the Jews and saying, we can't be as good as them because we didn't have the law, or perhaps the opposite. You're saying something to the effect of, you know, well, they're counting on the law, but I count on faith, so I'm better off too. No matter how you dice it up, as you so aptly put, that all are uh, sinful and fall short of the glory of God. And and I would take some of that back to uh, the Gospels where Jesus is speaking to the leaders, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. Uh, and, And some of them came to him trying to trap him. We know that, of course, because the Gospel writers tell us. But some of them, I believe, came to him. With, with at least a sincere question, whether they came in terms of faith or not, of course, is, is a different story. But, but some of them came to Jesus and sincerely asked him, what must I do to be saved? And one of the things in those gospel accounts that I always find interesting is that my Lutheran ears that have been through a catechism confirmation class, Lutheran uh, college, seminary, my Lutheran ears, when, when they hear that question, what must I do to be saved, expect Jesus to then turn to that person and say uh, something like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Or uh, he'll say, you know, we expect him to say these words from Romans chapter 3 about that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that the redemption has come through Christ Jesus. That's our expectation based on what we've been taught, which is correct. The teaching is correct. But notice what Jesus does. He meets those people where they are. And he knows that when he's speaking to those religious leaders and Pharisees uh, and, and teachers of the law, even the ones who are coming to him, perhaps with a sincere question, he's going to start out with where they are because otherwise they're not ready for that gospel message until they've heard that news in the law that they have indeed sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so they will say, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus might ask them, well, how do you think? How do you read the scripture? And they will usually then give some kind of an answer that involves keeping the law. And Jesus says those surprising words, okay, do this and you will live. The point, however, in there that he hasn't quite gotten to, but he does over time, is that if they could keep the law, just as Paul has mentioned here about Abraham back in verse 2 of chapter 4, if they could have kept the law perfectly, they would have had something to boast about. 
But the reality is they cannot do that. And so Jesus masterfully uses the law to, to again, bring people to the gospel. And that was true for somebody like Abraham, David, you and me, and again, our listeners as well. We, we recognize what, what a great blessing it is to have both the law and the gospel. That's absolutely right. Without that law being proclaimed in its fullest severity so that we can wrestle with it and finally conclude that we cannot save ourselves, right? Lex semper accusa, the law always accuses. But then, of course, that is the Holy Spirit working on us, preparing and tilling the soil of our heart to receive the gospel. And we are going to continue to study about how righteousness is the foundation Um, Pardon me, how faith's foundation is found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When we come back from our break, I am here with the Reverend John Green of Grace Chapel Lutheran Church and School, and we will be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language, and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. Children loved by God, welcome back this beautiful Wednesday, August 17th. I am so excited to be joined by my very first Lutheran pastor, uh, the man who introduced me to the faith of the Lutheran Church, uh, but also, of course, who uh, I uh, absolutely admire, And but he's con- currently serving at Grace Chapel Lutheran Church in School as a teacher as a pastor, pulpit supply, basically anything they need a pastor for, I assume. And I'm so excited to have him now on the air with us here on Thy Strong Word. We're studying Romans chapter 4, and we've just got done talking about how uh, lawless deeds are forgiven, sins are covered, and that the man whose sin is not counted against him is very blessed. But all of this comes because of Jesus Christ, not because of our keeping of the law. But right before the break, Pastor Green explained to us that the law is still very important. The law is still good and holy. It serves a purpose that the Holy Spirit uses to then, you know, make us uh, ready to receive the gospel. We're at verse 9 now, and we're going to read the next few verses here up through verse 12, and so we can talk about them. Here we go. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Well, that's a lot of talk about circumcision and uncircumcision. But the great thing about it is that we don't even have to really explain the details of circumcision unless you just really want to go into that, Pastor Green. Um, What we could talk about, though, is what it meant for the Jew and what kind of conflict might it have been causing in this Roman church. And then, of course, um, what what are we being taught here by the Holy Spirit? Uh, Take it away, brother. Well, I, I like to go back again to, to the time of Jesus and some of his interactions with, uh, with the Jewish leaders uh, in terms of their attitude. And their attitude would have been, and, and it was obviously very much on display in their conversations with Jesus, well, you are whoever you are, but we are children of Abraham. 
Um, and and in <clears throat> excuse me in their statements, you could hear their pride over something that they would say they were basically born with. That uh, that from the very beginning we have this tie-in with Abraham, and if we have this tie-in with Abraham, then we must have a tie-in with God. Interesting that if you took that. Uh, logic and applied it to Abraham, it would be saying almost like, well, Abraham was born circumcised. And obviously, from a physical perspective, we know that's not the case. But they're looking at it spiritually in very much the same manner, kind of patting themselves on the back and saying to Jesus, I've got this certificate. And on this certificate, it says that I'm a child of Abraham. So you can teach and say what you want, but I am getting in on this. And Paul here uh, in this chapter completely breaks that argument to pieces and completely tears that apart and breaks it down again through the law, uh, which would have been something they would have understood uh, only to, to build it back up based on the grace of God and faith in Christ. That's right. You know, I think that we also see circumcision, as you were saying, as sort of this, uh, this sign of the fact that we are uh, adopted into the faith or to the promise that was given to Abraham. And now, of course, that's true. But he's trying to make this distinction because there are people at this time who are saying, well, in order to be saved, sure, you can be saved, and it is through Christ, and we believe that Christ is the Messiah, but you still have to become a Jew first. He is, after all, a Jewish Messiah. He, after all, came first to the Jews. Paul, you know, certainly is one who held up the Jews and even in this diatribe has been explaining how the Jews do have some advantages because they have been brought in to the law, given the oracles of God uh, long before the Gentiles. But at the same time, just I love how you brought it back to Jesus, that the reality is that Everyone is saved the same way. There's no shortcut to the process. At the right. same time, it's also not based on anything you do. So when they were saying things like, well, we are of Abraham, I recall Jesus saying, well, you know, I can bring up, you know, the children of Abraham out of the rocks. Or when they say things like, we've never been enslaved to anyone because yeah. they didn't like the idea of being enslaved to sin. Of course, forgetting how many times God's chosen people had been enslaved throughout history. And so we get here and we see this division between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And so, yeah, is this circumcision, this recognition that we are of the Jews, um, this chosen people, well, Abraham, that circumcision is what marked him as chosen. And so if you have the mark, then you're in. If you don't, you don't. And as you so aptly put it, and as Paul brought out, yeah, this was before the circumcision. The circumcision was a sign, a, a seal, not the means by which he was saved. Right. Yes, yeah, definitely. And <clears throat> excuse me again, Paul really highlights this, I think, when you get to verses, uh, verse 11 of chapter four, where uh, it reads that he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, and that so then being kind of a concluding sort of a statement, here's the point that we can bring out of all of this, Paul is saying, he, he being Abraham is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. Because once again, we go back as we've been talking here already this morning, uh, how do they get righteousness credited to them? Their knee-jerk reaction would have been to say through good works. But Paul here is reminding them and us that righteousness is credited to us as a gift. It is not of works, as Paul would write somewhere else in Scripture, so that no one could boast, so that no one, Jew or Gentile, long-term Christian, short-term Christian, knowledgeable, well-learned Christian, someone who struggles in, in knowing a lot of things. No, so no matter the background, the situation, the circumstance, that righteousness is credited to us, not because of our works, but because of the works of Christ on our behalf, 
and that by his grace, he has saved us through faith in him. Absolutely. And that is what is key, faith. Let's get into the next verses here as we read through verse 25. That's actually the rest of the chapter. And here Paul begins to lay out the argument for faith, starting with verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Oh, wow. Thank you, St. Paul. He's definitely getting into some gospel territory here with our father, Abraham. Absolutely. Yes, he is. Um, one thing I would like to, to sort of mention in this also, I think, that's a little bit of a sidelight, but it's certainly here in verses 18 and following, is how often God likes to use uh, physical aspects or elements of this world which he has created in order to either make himself known or, or make himself present in some sense. And obviously, the, the ultimate uh, of that sort of thing is, is when God uses the sacraments, when he uses uh, not just words, but literally uses water combined with his word in baptism to do what? To wash away our sin, to bring us forgiveness, uh, to, to save us. And also that God uses the very physical elements of bread and wine uh, along with the, the word of God, again, so that the body and blood are present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. But that God has used very physical elements that we can touch and taste and understand as human beings uh, to, do, to do things that, in a certain sense, we can't fully understand, but he uses those physical means uh, to bring them to us. And so here, again, in verses 18 and following, God is using the physical fact that Abraham and Sarah were probably beyond what one would consider to be the usual childbearing years, uh, to the point that Sarah even laughs when she hears the news, that, uh, the prediction that God makes, which of course he will bring to pass, that she is going to become pregnant and going to have a son. And she laughs. Why? Because in the normal, natural, everyday realities of this world, that probably wasn't going to happen with someone of her age. And yet God is pleased to use those facts, to use those realities uh, of our physical existence to act and to act in such a way that we cannot mistake, but know that he was involved and this is the activity of God to his praise and the glory of his grace. I love that connecting the connecting this idea to the sacraments, because you, when you mention Sarah laughs, I think about those who look at the sacraments of God, these great condescensions to us, right? God knows that we need these physical, uh, you know, 
incarnate types of ways to receive his grace. He certainly he certainly doesn't need to use them, but he gives them for our benefit. And Absolutely. so right through simple bread and wine, he gives us Christ's true body and blood through that simple just water that can be found everywhere. He uses that to wash away our sins and bestow upon us faith. But there are people out in the world who will laugh. They will laugh out of disbelief or out of mockery saying that those things are certainly not the way that God uses them. And yet he does. And the reason he does is very much connected to the reality, just as you brought out. Abraham and Sarah have no business receiving a promise that they are going to be the parents of all these generations, especially in their old age, even for back then, and also because of Sarah's barrenness. And yet God makes his promise come to fruition, even despite physical limitations. And so, as you said, we know that it's from God. I love that. Right. And we move on and look at verse 21, where it's talking again about Abraham. Uh, having been strengthened in his faith, gives glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Pastor Boo, let me ask you a question. How had Abraham been fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised? Well, Abraham has seen God fulfill his promise before. Yes, exactly. And you can, We can go back through Genesis and see time and time again Uh, Sometimes when Abraham was believing, sometimes when maybe he was a little skeptical, sometimes when Abraham was even trying to do his own thing in a few instances, that again and again and again he had seen God keep his promises to the point it was so powerful. God's activity there, God's action in his life was so powerful that as it says here, he was fully persuaded. We're going to have a kid. Well, normally I wouldn't believe that, but you know, I've seen God act in our lives, so I am I don't doubt that a bit. That's going to happen. You could just imagine that thought process going through his mind so that he was indeed fully persuaded. And that kind of faith really only comes from God. Because if Abraham had relied on his human reason, right, he might have been a little bit more in the position of Sarah, kind of giggling at the thought. Sure. Um, And I don't, by the way, I don't actually say to the point where Sarah's giggling makes her unfaithful. It's just kind of a ridiculous situation. Right. But Abraham knows that God is not constrained. Although what's wonderful, and we're talking about, you know, putting St. Paul up on a pedestal, putting Abraham, the patriarch, our father, up on a pedestal. But, you know, he falls into a little disbelief, too. Later on, he's going to have uh, some issues consistently uh, keeping with God and his promises. However, I think the the height of his faithfulness is displayed, of course, when God calls for him to um, sacrifice Isaac. Right. You know, there was a situation where, you know, he figures I can fulfill God's promises without waiting on him. And we know how that turned out. Mm-hmm. But then when Isaac comes along and this is the way that God had chosen, then suddenly Abraham, you know, he says, I have to rely on God's promises because when I go astray from them, things don't work out. Huh. And so even if I don't understand how in the world that I'm going to have a multitude of nations come from me through my only son, the way God has given me, then uh, then I guess I figure if he wants me to sacrifice him, he'll just raise him from the dead as we are given insight into in Hebrews. But right. yeah, this this is what this faithfulness is about, is trusting God even when your own reason and the whole world, and of course Satan, is telling you that it doesn't make sense. Well, and, and you and I also realize that uh, when when Isaac asks that question, you know, Lord, where is or Abraham, Father, where is the, the, the sacrifice? Where is the animal? And Abraham's response is that God will provide the sacrifice, my son. And of course, it, it's a moment of tremendous faith right then and there with the relationship of Abraham and his son Isaac. But those words that he says for us also foreshadow the fact that the sacrifice is going to be provided by God, that the one who will save us from our sin, uh, Jesus, will be coming again from the hand and through the plan of God. And, uh, and that's an amazing 
foreshadowing, looking well into the future. Um, and again, Abraham can only see that uh, by faith. Paul says here, too, that the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. How does that speak to us even today in 2022? How can we, you know, put our faith, hope, and trust in God and appreciate the words counted to him as righteousness as it applies to our faith? Well, you know, count, counted toward us uh, has a sense of it as though we are not the source of the righteousness. And, you know, sometimes I think we as Christians really do make good faith efforts uh, at change where necessary, uh, trying to, to, to put away sin, okay, those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes we may have some degree of success, but on our own, we fall short again and again. Uh, we, we have to come back to the source of our righteousness again and again. And we have to come, as is written in, in that hymn, uh, Rock of Ages, one of the verses says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I claim. And, and even when we are uh, in our most uh, attempting to be our most faithful, sometimes that's when uh, our sin devastates us the most. And even in those moments, we come back to the tender hands, the tender nail-scarred hands of our shepherd, the Lord Jesus, who welcomes us back who forgives us, who loves us, who protects us, and who lifts us up that we may continue to move forward in his work and in his will, having received from him what we could not do for ourselves and having received from him what he would have us give to others in that regard too. Absolutely. You know, we think about, and I love how you pointed out that, you know, even when we're trying to be the most faithful, that, that often will present to us the most troubles, troublesome challenge of, of feeling secure in the faith. Yes. And when we think about somebody like Abraham, and Paul says that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, and he says counted to him is not just for him but for you, it's easy for us to think, well, yeah, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He he's the father of uh, the nations. He's he made the Bible. You know that's how famous his faith was. And we start to take faith as if that means we have to do something. Mm -hmm. So growing up down south, and uh, and you you know you obviously were down there too with me. We have so many brothers and sisters in Christ in other faith traditions that see faith itself as a work that they must do. Right. They must believe and they must demonstrate their faith in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Giving your heart to Jesus, saying the sinner's prayer, even baptism and the Lord's Supper are not gifts of grace to some Christians, but rather acts of their faith to prove their faithfulness. And uh, of course, our mission is to both celebrate our shared salvation in Jesus, but also to hopefully guide even our brothers and sisters in Christ and other faith traditions to this better understanding. And that's what Paul is saying here. Faith to be counted to us means that even the faith itself is not something we do. And he uh, and we don't have to be Abraham or St. Paul or someone whose lives and experiences rated being included in the Bible because we have Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, God spoke to Abraham. Yes, God spoke to to Paul, you know, Jesus appeared to Paul, but we have Jesus too. And that's verse 24, right? It's ours also. It's counted or reckoned or credited to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord. I just love that. And that belief, understanding that is not making a commitment for Christ, although we should do that daily, but rather is be receiving the ability to believe from the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the focus is on Jesus. It's Jesus's good works that save us from our sins. Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses. And, of course, what good is a dead God? None. So he continues, 
raised for our justification. Jesus is alive. Yes, we preach Christ and him crucified, but that includes the fact that he was raised from the dead, raised himself from the dead, ascended into heaven, oh, and one day he's coming back. We just have a few minutes left in our program, and you've done such an amazing job bringing out the gospel for our listeners, but just a few more minutes here. If you could just give us some final words that leave our listeners with the hope of the gospel and some application, too, about how we can share this gospel with other people through this better understanding that Paul gives us about righteousness and the law and faith and, of course, Jesus. Sure. Well, one thing that I want to mention is um, it's always good as we as we read any part of Scripture to consider the context, to consider the author, uh, to consider the lives of the people who are talked about when there's a, a story involving people. Um, and, and I would say it's important here that we remember in terms of Paul where he started and where he is at this point, that he began as someone who was very steeped in the idea of works righteousness, of earning his way into heaven. I think Paul was very, when he was Saul of Tarsus, I think that he was uh, very dedicated to that. Uh, which which took him off in some terrible directions, quite frankly, in some cases. But what happened? What happened was he was confronted by the Savior. He was confronted by the crucified and risen one whom he had been persecuting. I, I can only imagine how Paul must have shuddered when he asked that question on the road to Damascus, having been knocked to his knees and blinded and saying, Who are you, Lord? And the response, probably the the response he would least likely have wanted to have heard in that moment was the response he heard, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, all of a sudden, all of his works righteousness shattered to dust in an instant with those words. But what happened? God picked him up, took him into the city, rebuilt him spiritually in a manner of speaking, and, and applied to Paul, excuse me, applied to Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, applied to him the good news that Paul, Jesus Christ, died for you. You who had been persecuting him, he has died for you, and he is your Savior also. And as we go about our daily lives, uh, dealing with all kinds of people, some of whom have carried tremendous burdens, some of whom long to know God, some of whom who don't, uh, the reality is still true that as that as we bring that Jesus in our words and in our actions to them, uh, we are bringing to them that place, the only place where they can find hope. We are bringing to them the one that gives them the life-giving water, the one who suffered and died for us and for them. And that's why it's both so important that we carry that message to others and why it's such a joy when we do, because we know what he did for us. We know what he did for them, and we pray that he will work in their hearts, perhaps even through our humble words and actions, to see them come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved by his grace through faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you've been listening to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo, and my guest has been the Reverend John Green, pastor over at Grace Chapel Lutheran Church and School, in uh, the in in St. Louis, where actually, what what is the suburb of St. Louis? Uh, Bell Fountain Neighbors. Bell Fountain Neighbors. We're so happy to have had. I'm so happy to have had him on, and I'm sure you are too. After hearing the wonderful gospel proclamation, as we explored Chapter Four of Paul's letter to the Romans, we will be back tomorrow as we continue our study with Chapter Five. Until then, God's peace and blessings to you. Until we meet again. 